My name is uh, Kobus van Ziel. Um, I'm representing the EWRA Water Distribution System Analysis um, History Project. The purpose of this project is to uh, develop the history of water distribution systems analysis. A key element of this project is a series of interviews with researchers, developers and uh, practitioners on their personal experiences in the field. Our interview today is with Alan Lambert. Uh, Alan is internationally known for his work on water loss management and um, this interview is being conducted at the CCWI conference in Sheffield in the UK on September the 6th, 2017. Alan, um, how did you get first get into the field? Yes, uh, I had to get into leakage, uh, it's an interesting uh, path. Uh, I've always been fascinated with the water, ever since I was small. Um, so I went into civil engineering and found hydraulics, and that was natural for me to go into. Did a master's in uh, open channel hydraulics, and then hydrology was just starting off in the UK. This was uh, 63, 64, a long time ago now. Uh, and uh, so um, I went to one of the first postgraduate courses in hydrology and water resources, just love that. Worked for the river authorities, um, uh, always keen on modelling, but very practical uh, aspects of modelling. Um, I've done an MSc in, in hydraulics at Liverpool uh, as well. And um, I thought I'd never leave hydrology, I just love the subject, um, uh, everything, flood forecasting, Reservoir control, groundwater. Uh, I even got to be president of the um, British Hydrological Society at one stage. And then <coughs> the uh, Welsh Water uh, um, started to become multi purpose, and I switched into water distribution and suddenly found out uh, about leakage. And I suddenly realised this was a field that had never been uh, properly modelled or researched. Uh, it was a lot of, uh, well, the utility down the road did it this way and they seemed to get results, so we'll try doing the same thing. And uh, did some work in Welsh Water for that, uh, also in charge of the leakage side teams, and uh, then became the technical secretary, third representative on the uh, first national control, leakage control initiative in the early 90s. Uh, just after privatisation of the uh, companies. Uh, I became even more fascinated with it and um, uh, uh, that was the point really, where after 25 years in hydrology, uh, a subject I really loved, I decided that this was, this was where I was going to go because we couldn't do water resources management if we didn't understand leakage. What year did you first get into into the interest in, in the leakage in the leakage uh, problem? What year was that? Uh, it started in about um, I first assumed responsibility for it in about 1984, 1985, and I tried to apply what were the standard methods then in a very early day in North Wales, and um, lots of the methods just didn't seem to work. They were more designed for uh, working in towns. We had night flows, uh, we had some work on pressure management in the UK, but it didn't really seem to all hang together. So the National Leakage Control Initiative, I was seconded to work on that as technical secretary for two years, and it meant I could really get into it. And I actually started to apply many uh, hydrological principles to um, uh, the methods of analysis, like um, the uh, component analysis of leakage actually uh, comes from the ideas in Penman's uh, calculation of evapotranspiration. I, I, I just realised that if we broke leakage down into different components with different uh, frequencies and durations and uh, parameters that, that, they, that influence them, that we might have a chance. And uh, within about two years, we had component analysis. That was a big breakthrough. Yeah. Alan, you you internationally recognised. Mm -hmm. Whenever people talk about leakage, uh, people think about your name, uh, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, you've made a huge contribution. So, thinking back about uh, over your career in in the water loss field, can you can you tell us what you think were the main advances, and tell us something about what your role in that was and how these things came about? 
Well, um, I, I took voluntary severance from uh, Welsh Wars in 1995, and I was very interested in, in leaves at that stage, and also, by that time, I'd come across John May's work, because up till 1995, we knew the pressure influenced distribution systems, but we couldn't figure out how to predict it or why it varied from one place to another. And I went to a talk by John, which was very mathematical. It turned most people off, but uh, it was like a, a moment of revelation. I thought, this guy has really cracked it. He understands why. So really, in a way, I became a disciple of John's and put that together, uh, the FAVAD, with the uh, component analysis. And then we had uh, two really powerful tools in combination, which meant we could analyze almost any uh, system night flows, we could break them down, understand them, annual water balance, and so on. And the opportunity came up, I thought, well, I'll, I'll join the IWA, do some international work. I got one job for World Bank in the Caribbean, and I thought, oh, this is quite good. <laughs> quite like this, you know. Um, and um, then I became the leader of the first water loss task force. And uh, so we, we had the task of uh, setting a, a new standard water balance internationally and looking at the performance indicators. We spent about five years doing that, just a small team uh, of uh, specialists from uh, USA and uh, Japan, Germany. And we all learned a lot from each other. I learned a lot from them about international things. I realised that the way we did it in UK um, wasn't necessarily the best way for uh, applying it in other places. That, and, and so I started to realise that internationally we had to have models that would work everywhere. It was very challenging, um, but it wasn't good enough to have one model that worked just for one, one country and one for another. And I started visiting many countries, uh, helping, advising, testing out the drafts. It took us about five years to develop those, um, and then the first Water Loss Task Force was supposed to com complete its work in 2000. And we all met at the conference uh, in Brunel. And uh, everyone realised at the same time that uh, what we had was something rather special that uh, could be used internationally. And it was decided we'd carry on and have a second task force, which would be for seeking to implement it. And then the whole thing just grew and grew like uh, topsy to uh, uh, conferences on leakage with upwards of 500 people, all using the same uh, language, uh, the same kind of ideas, uh, were success stories. And, um, I became particularly interested then in two aspects of it, which I thought were very weak. The first one was the understanding of uh, pressure and bursts, which nobody seemed to recognise. And the second one was my obsession with how useless uh, percentages are, percentage of system input volume as a performance indicator. So I tend to spend most of my time on researching those. And, and I work with groups of colleagues there. So I've got a kind of a chart that shows all the things we've done since we started, and it just keeps going on and on and on. Economic intervention, um, but all, all, all kinds of things. But the latest one is the, the, which was really based on most work done in Australia about five, six years ago, during the millennium drought, which is the effect of uh, pressure on bursts, which is now acknowledged, but 10 years ago, if you went to a conference and someone and you said, well, you know the pressure influences bursts, people would say, well, there's no proof of that. We haven't seen any papers on it. Uh, nobody's doing it. Mm -hmm. So a few of us got together, and uh, Julian Thornton and, uh, and yourself, of course, with, with what you've been doing down at, at um, uh, the South African universities, uh, and uh, bringing it to people's attention, success stories, uh, and this really then took off about 2006 because people could see that if you did this properly and selected the, the zones properly, you could make huge savings. Uh, in, in Australia now, pressure management isn't about leakage, pressure management is about asset management. Uh, what do you see as the, the primary advances that we can expect in the next decade or so? 
Well, uh, having been in the snake game for quite a long time now, uh, I always used to think that we would always make water last okay, but uh, as the population does keep growing, and uh, obviously the resources uh, are finite ultimately, uh, we can see ways in which we can make some savings, some uh, demand management reductions, lower shower heads, and you know, other things like this. But if, if I look ahead 20, 30, 40 years, we are coming to, uh, to the crunch on, on these things. And uh, most of our systems just aren't actually designed for low consumption and for, for low leakage. Uh, they aren't designed to be built with, and, and sectorized already with pressure managed areas, district metered areas, things like this. We're doing reverse engineering to get to that stage, but there's still plenty of places where operating at 50, 60, 70 meters pressure. Uh, and what we know now about pressure and leak flow rates, and pressure and bursts, and pressure and consumption, and we've seen it at this conference, um, it's more than a linear relationship. And uh, ultimately, people have got to, uh, I, I think, understand that pressure is like, uh, with the economics, they said the market is the hidden force behind, the, behind uh, um, that drives things. Um, and, and to my mind, pressure is the hidden force. Uh, and we, we, we talk about it and some people measure it, but nobody actually recognizes um, its fundamentals. I mean, it's like uh, if you were trying to get the first spaceship to the moon, but you knew that gravity existed, but you didn't want to take into account in, in, in your calculations. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're kind of at that stage where people, if the pressure drops, that they want higher pressure. We had an example where someone said about a fire, and the pressure was controlled because of leakage, and it was said, I don't know if it's true, that the, um, the, 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 the pressure should have been higher. But that's a big challenge. How do we get people to accept that ultimately, even in cities, it might be that the distribution systems have to run at 10 or 15 meters pressure, and if you want higher pressure, you have to generate that by putting energy into the system, but only in the places where mm -hmm. it's needed. Mm -hmm. uh, un unfortunately, I, I won't be able to see that probably. <laughs> well, let's hope you are. Um, yeah. uh, thank you, Alan. Any, any final thoughts you want to, to add? Just that I've had the, the most wonderful uh, professional experience doing this. Um, I met many, many uh, fantastic people and uh, worked with them as groups. I've always tried to, although I've got an academic background, obviously, I've always tried to form a bridge between the, the, the great stuff which has been in academically and putting it in terms of uh, how people on the ground can understand it and implement it. And that, again, has been a the theme of this conference. Uh, I think that academically people have to start uh, using different language when they're trying to talk to utilities. Because I've often made the point, as soon as you start showing Greek letters or the, uh, integrals and mathematics, you, you just turn people on. You've got to uh, find good ways of um, presenting it just to the level that they need and maybe so you've got 95% of the good theory in there, but it, 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 it's shown to them in a very simple way. Because if you've got 3,000 district metered areas to look at, then you, you have to find something fast uh, quick to, to, to deal with uh, and that's really what I've concentrated on what I've been doing flood forecasting for World Met Office or reservoir control rules or whatever. I'm always thinking of the guy on the ground how can I uh, give him some added value so that he can understand the data that he's seeing a bit better be a, and work a bit smarter. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So it's been a, been a rocket ride and uh, been fantastic. <laughs> Great. Thank, yeah. thank you, Alan. Uh, okay. Thank you for spending the time with us. Okay.